Mm. Yum, yum. Hey guys, so we are going to be planting a flower bed today, sort of like a flower bed, because it was kind of pre-planted already when we got here. And you'll see, this is what we're starting with. So on the left over here, we have an Acer palmatum. Here we have this interesting conifer, maybe like a Picea or an Abies or something along those lines, that's prostrate and spreading. And then up here we have this weeping pinus, I'm guessing a pinus stroba, so a white pine, because that's what these <laughs> look like. Right here, these cones. And I kind of got started without y'all because I went in and already started to plant the bed because some of the plants came in. So what I have here is this Cornus canadensis. And this is a native plant. And I love this plant because it has a lot of interest kind of all season long. You could see that they have the white bracts and you might say, hey, this looks so much like my regular dogwoods. And you'd be right, it's in the same family, it's Cornus. Oftentimes you'll see Cornus florida, which is our native dogwood, or Cornus cusa, which I believe is an Asian uh, variety. So we also have Cornus moss, by the way. That's another dogwood that we, uh, you might often see. So this one spreads by rhizomes. You could see that here these little rhizomes coming out. And it's a slow spreader, but it is mat forming. So I'd like to see this in our forest and I'd like to see this in this area. Now we have a nice light here that's coming in. This is an Eastern facing space. This is North, that's South. And, um, and you really get a partially shaded to shaded area here, especially if you're planting behind this conifer or behind the maple or underneath this. Um, and the, the shadows casting. So this is to me more of a shade garden area. This needs to be prepped up again and pepped up again because I would like to see a little bit more compost on here and also some composted bark mulch on top of that to protect it. It's one of the things that we tried to do when we, when we got to this land, um, but we got here in late fall, we didn't really get our bearings until November and by that time we were under snow. So a lot of these plants actually took a big hit. Now you'll also notice some shrubs. That one's kind of turning a little uh, reddish along the edges. And then its sister plant, which is over to the left, which has flowers. And that is a viburnum. I'll be planting lots of viburnum here. And that one's called Little Ditty. And I brought this one out because this is about how big it will get two to three feet tall, two to three feet wide. So um, I'm excited about that because I don't want something too big behind there. And then I'll take you through uh, some of the other plants that I'm gonna be planting. So what's nice about this bed is that it does have fully amended soil. So it's not like the soil that we have here, which is about a quarter clay, which is really hard to work with. So when I was planting this, uh, this Cornus canadensis, it went in very easily. I'll also be using Espoma's Biotone. This is a great starting material because it gives you really nice nutrients and also some helpful bacteria to really help with transplanting. And some of these plants I just got uh, ordered and came in off a truck. Uh, some of these I picked up at a local nursery um, some of these I picked up from local growers. So I'll take you through some of the plants that I have here. And they're not all natives. Uh, some of them are, some of them are native ours. Uh, so cultivated varieties of native plants. But <clears throat> this is uh, one of those Japanese painted ferns. And I really liked the, the light blue color, light bluish gray color with the red. This really does redden up. And I got some kind of old fashioned uh, bleeding hearts. So I think this one, this cultivar's name is Valentine. And then some geraniums, purple gold, ghost. So oftentimes when you're in the forest here, you'll see these geraniums kind of growing 
not this specific geranium, but you'll often see geraniums growing and I loved the color of these leaves. So I'm kind of working, you'll see I'm working off this Acer palmatum, this kind of red tone. And then I also have these Tiarella foam flowers. I'll show you our, our native one. This I picked up from a local nursery that only works with natives. So you see it like that and you can see the difference. So it has this, um, you know, kind of almost like maple leaf, but one has a little red center. And I am so glad I went in on these quickly because, you know, everyone and their mother is gardening, which is a great thing. But if you're not on what you want to order for the year, then oftentimes everything gets sold out. So I went and bought some stuff early in the year and I wanted to buy some more all sold out. All right, let's see what else. Gallium odorata. This is sweet woodruff. This grows in part shade to shade completely. So you'll see it under, under the forest on the forest floor. And my idea was, let's get some of this like limey green. You could see the Cornus canadensis has this lime green. Then it gets a little red berry on it after uh, the blooms. The birds love that. In the fall, it turns red. And this one gets a little white flower. It's perfect for pollinators, especially on the forest floor. And we could actually plant that under the Acer palmatum. You'll notice that uh, these are quite tiny. I don't mind getting tiny plants because it's easier to dig the hole, um, especially if you're working with difficult soil. And then I have these, uh, these are not native. These are uh, toad lilies. And this one gets a nice dark purplish aubergine flower and again playing off of that color of that acer palmatum and then i'll take you over here to these guys i just picked these up at my one of my local garden centers and these are hookahs they're very common in shade gardens and they come in so many different colors and flavors so this is frosted violet and again i had kind of that acer palmatum in my mind's eye and I was like, ooh, that would be a nice uh, sharp contrast. And so you could see kind of what I'm doing here. I don't know if these will go into this garden. They want more full sun. These are the, the guaras and uh, they're beautiful. I picked them up, but they might go in another garden. I just brought out this little ditty. I'm not gonna plant another one in here because it's already kind of planted up, but I wanted to show you the shape and size of it. And then you might be wondering what these are. And this is goat's beard. These are all bare root. So you're like, oh my God, they're so tiny. I actually love bare root plants because again, I don't have to dig such a huge hole, especially if you're working with like difficult uh, soil, which typically in this area, I am working with difficult soil. So this is a uh, Aruncas and we do have a native one, but this is not native. I think this is native to the Himalayas. And it basically, why I got this one as opposed to the regular goat's beard is regular goat's beard grows really tall and it gets this like white spiky kind of flower. This one only grows about two feet tall max. So that was kind of neat. And then I tried to get more of these guys, not natives, but these are Regersia's fireworks. And these get like a palmate leaf, probably get about three feet tall. The, the leaf is a dark bronzy copper color, so similar to the Acer palmatum, and then it gets a really beautiful red flower on it. I went to get six of them. I could only get two, so uh, I'm going to be planting up their little tag too, because when you plant bare root, sometimes you forget where you plant. So I'm going to get started. This is like an apple cider tea. It's very good. It's just like drinking apple cider. And I put some of this tincture in it that has marshmallow root and Tulsi basil. It's so good. It tastes like, yeah, apple cider is warm too. Yeah, it's very good. Oh, that's very tasty. Um, by the way, you might notice that there's a hose coming out from here. So obviously I want to leave a space for the hose. And this is a very, it's got not a lot of weeds, but you know what helps the, that mulch dampens down the possibility for weeds, but you still get some weeds like this right here. 
That's, um, this is uh, garlic mustard, so you could just pull that right out. I'm not gonna worry too much about the weeds right now because as I'm planting, I'll probably be pulling them up. And I might move around some of these uh, Cornus canadensis as well, depending, because I, I got a lot of plants. I almost forgot that I <laughs> bought all these kinds of plants. And, you know, this, I should just already say, I'm not working with like a pre, like I'm working with a pre-planted bed. So you might, and these are really well-established trees. So when I stick my shovel in, I might hit a root and where I wanna actually put plants may, may alter. So how I like to work is just placing plants where I think they should be. And if they have to change, then they have to change. I know this is going to be harder for us to work around because we are, we are going to have to finish the side of the house. But we'll work with what we have and you can see these back here. These galliums are perfect. You know, if you ever go in the forest, you see these on the forest floor. They could have little spikes of color coming out from areas like this. Yeah, and most of these, if they want like part shade to shade, you're talking about like maybe, maybe max four hours of sun. And these will spread, I should say that. These will start to spread on their own, but they're not like invaders. So, and if you like, I want to leave a little bit of space for my feet when I'm walking, but if you tamp down on a couple of these, that's okay too. I already started planting this area also with some bulbs, snowdrops and things like that. Yeah, they came up really well, so I was excited for that. I planted them in the fall, just on a whim, just to say, oh, like, let's, let's see if this works. Okay, so let's go with the foam flower. The goat's beard and the aruncus, I'm actually gonna plant on either side of the uh, hose. And when I'm planting a flower bed, I like to look at the structure, different flowers, different leaves. Uh, you, you could work it, you don't wanna have all the same leaf shape. It might look a little, little weird or all the same flower shape. Tall, right? Yeah, it's tall. It'll stick the flower up, which is nice. Again, it still gets light there at some point. How much space are you putting around these plants? There'll, there'll be recommendations on your plant itself, but for me, I will sometimes disregard that because I will plant more densely. And um, if they spread, you could, always, you could always thin them out. But if you look on the, like, the forest floor, a true forest floor that's not like attacked by deer. The forest floor will be fully green. I am all for that to, to plant more densely and I'd rather not see as much of the composted bark mulch. I know some people like will be very precious and then have one plant here and one plant here. I'd rather see lots of plants, a lot of interest. All right, I'll get these guys later, but I think I have enough to work with as far as planting goes. And um, I might actually get started with some of these ones under the Acer palmatum. So I'm gonna bring this over with me. Thank you. This whole place is a work in progress. I gotta get under here. Now I got these from Bluestone Perennial. This one looks a little janky, but um, you, could, you could plant this pot. It says plant this pot right with it, but I'm not gonna do that. Um, it's a coconut coir pot. That's fine if it actually that actually biodegrades, but I'm not gonna do that. And I don't mind if the leaves are looking a little tattered from traveling because the roots are still good. You can see how healthy the roots are here. 
very nice network. It's not like root bound or anything like that. Now what I'm gonna do is, typically if you're preparing a plant bed, you can work with the biotone in with the whole plant bed, but like I said, the bed is already kind of pre-prepared. So I'm just gonna go in here. I'm gonna get about a teaspoon of this. So if you're planting a, a bulb or whatever, I'm gonna work that into the soil, just like that. And that should give it a nice, healthy start. I'm gonna water all these in afterwards. This has got a nice mulch on it already, but I'm gonna probably run into the city and get some more compost, sprinkle that on top for a nice additional organic treat. All right, this is the next one that looks a little more vibrant. And this soil is so nice. I wish all of our soil was like this, but it's not. So you can see it. it's nice and so easy. You can see someone's root is coming up here. So I don't wanna totally dig that out. Okay, so. And I'm not gonna keep these tags. I kind of find that uh, tags can be very distracting from the garden. And pretty soon it's gonna spread all over the place. The only tags that I'm gonna put in for now are the ones with the, uh, the bare root bulbs. So I remember that I planted them there and that we don't step on them. Just a little handful. And I'm gonna sprinkle that in. Like that. In and I'm just going to start to backfill it with that beautiful soil that I dug out. So the Biotone has not only nice, a nice starter fertilizer, organic starter fertilizer. This has been growing in this pot, right? And yeah, and but, but it also has um, some helpful bacteria and some helpful fungi to get this plant started and growing and you can actually use the biotone um, over again what i'd probably do is end up fertilizing this during the uh, spring and summer months as well but you you probably don't need to if you just have the biotone and you're putting some of the you know say like a composted manure or a mushroom compost on top of it because that's also a nice organic fertilizer and then you're putting the composted bark mulch on top what the composted bark mulch will do is that it maintains the moisture, maintains any type of temperature flux, so it's not gonna get too hot or too cold, not too hot in the summer, not too cold in the winter. And it also will keep down the weeds, which as you can see, we have some that you might not want in your garden beds, like the, the dandelions. Okay, so this is planted in, this cornice is planted in, and we're gonna start with these painted ferns. All right, so let's see with this first painted fern. Now these are a little bit bigger, so I have to I have to use more muscle. I went in here actually and already uh, trimmed this Acer palmatum and this uh, this conifer here. I think it's a spruce. I think it's a prostrate spruce. Now I am hitting somebody's roots, and I'm also hitting a. See, this is a root right here. So I wanna be mindful of that. I might have to work around that. I might have to go in a little bit over here. So these are the things that you find out when you really wanna put a plant somewhere, but then somebody else is taking up that airspace, which is why it's nice to kind of plant a bed all at the same time, because you're not having to deal with like someone else's root zone. This seems a little more promising. It's another benefit of working with smaller plants as opposed to going with like larger plants because with the larger plants, you have a larger root zone right off the bat because they're more developed. Ideally, I'd be getting a larger shovel to work in here, but then I risk uh, hurting some of the, the plants here. So that's why I'm just working with a shovel. If you have a, a bad wrist, then you might wanna take it easy or have someone else dig the holes for you. Okay, this is getting, this is getting down to a good place. Oh, it's a nice root system here. 
That's actually not a bad fit. All right. It's uh, it's pretty much at soil level, so I'm going to add some biotone to this. So larger plants, I'm going to add a little bit more. This is some of the pieces that I cut off that Acer. It did get a little bit of deer browse. Okay, I'm going to fit that right in, backfill it. And again, I'll water all of these in at the end when I'm done, as opposed to along the way. It's much easier with my hose to do that. What you want to do is you want to get as much of the, um, you want to get some of the air pockets out. You don't want a root kind of sitting without any soil around it. Uh, and then this is, this is a very nice kind of silty, loamy, um, dark, organic matter soil that I'm working with right now, thankfully. Otherwise you'd see me really struggling with this. And, uh, and it, it, it will probably have uh, plenty of air in there. So it's not like you're compacting the soil by walking on it all the time. Okay, I'm under, I'm under here. I will have to check myself for ticks afterwards though because I definitely got a tick when I was planting. I'm not sure when. There's, this is broken already, so I'm gonna break that. You're gonna have to hand me some of that biotone. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so soft under here. I kinda wanna plant everything under the Acer. <laughs> All right, that just worked out really well. If you can hand me some biotone, maybe put a little biotone in here, a little sprinkle, sprinkle. Push the soil back in. Looks like it was always planted here. There we go. It's nice. It's a, we're working with all this duff down here. It's so pleasant. I could tell just the you. Dead leaves from this tree. Just the dead leaves falling, just like on a forest floor. The only thing I have to be careful of is like when the leaves get on this one, um, it could it could hurt the plant because and then you'll just the leaves will die back. So it's kind of funny. You want leaves on the ground, but you also want to. Um, yeah, so they shade out these, they sh these needles. And the needles die back, yeah. Back. When I bought these uh, ferns, they were under some shade cloth, but it was out in the sun and they were looking really sad. Uh, and then just with a little shade and a little water, they perked right up. So I am trying to go wider on the hole, but you, you want to go just as deep. So we need to go a little further down than that. And this is nice because I'm not dealing with any roots. So that's why I took the, the gallium out because the gallium is much smaller. It's not as deep. But here, I'm not digging up anyone's roots. At least it doesn't feel like I am. Okay. That's pretty good. Okay, so I'm going to add some biotone here. And just like this. Backfill it. All this beautiful leafage here. That will be a nice holdover for when I get the compost bark mulch.
up as I go. Gardening can be messy. I have my last two foam flowers right here. I already got holes. It's, How did it go? It went really well, especially around here. Oh my gosh, all this pine mulch. Look at this. It's like three inches of duff. It's so nice. And then you get our regular soil down below, which is a little clay, but uh, very easy to dig around here. I did hit on the hookahs. They were pretty root bound, so I kind of massaged their roots open. And um, I had to plant them a little bit deeper and I was hitting kind of our native soil. So he probably amended this, you know, four to six inches. And then we have a couple inches on top of this like pine duff, which is amazing. So I'm just adding a little biotone along the way, help with the transfer. It's nice you got it between the soil of the actual soil that came with the plant. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, and, but the soil here that we have is really nice that they amended and it's been kind of probably working, you know, with this tree in a nice fashion for years, but it's underplanted, you know? I, I wanna create like a really naturalistic bed. And I think over the years, a lot of this uh, rhizomatous plants, like the Cornus canadensis and like the gallium will start to spread just on the surface and look really nice. Okay, get some of that and then get some biotone. All right. And then that, I just got off the phone with the guy who's gonna be delivering composted bark mulch. He'll be delivering that tomorrow. We'll get some compost, a small compost to spread over the top of this and then the composted bark mulch, which is starting to look like soil already. It's been aged at least six months. So then what does the espoma soil do? That will give it some more nutrients on top. So you don't want to put like pure manure on top or anything like that, because it would burn the plants. You want some composted manure, so we'll get some of that. We'll probably eventually be making it ourselves, but we just got here and we don't have um, you know, compost. So we'll use some of the Spoma biotone to help with the, the, the root transfer into this new bed, planting bed. And then we'll put a, sprinkle a little bit of um, composted uh, manure on top. And then we'll do composted bark mulch on top of that. And the bark mulch is to protect. To protect. Whatever's underneath it. Yeah, to protect, to, the to regulate the temperature, to keep the moisture in. Which, speaking of moisture, I think we should actually water this now. Oh, so we can water it all in. Nice little wrench. Oh, look at that, that looks nice. So this is one of those uh, commercial hose head sprayers. Now it's very dry towards the house. The soil that I was met with there was very dry, so I wanna make sure. You don't want water up against your house, but well, you well, we have yeah, I mean, we have concrete right there, so. And then these are, you see some plant tags sticking up. That's where I planted some of the bare root plants. I just want to remember that they're there. They are starting to come up, but. How much water are you giving before you feel like you're getting too much? Well, this is such a delicate, nice rain. And it's, we're going to hit the sunny part of the day. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give them a good a good drench. What's the best time to water this? I would say in the early morning hours, before you hit high heat of the day. And um, if you water them at night, you know, of course uh, they'll be sitting in a little bit of water and they won't be evapotranspiring until the morning. But these are plants that are typical of like forest floors. They want a little part shade. They want a little moisture. They don't like to be super dry. Um, now I have to go in here and I'm gonna take out some of the weeds as well. I started to take out the weeds as I went. I didn't wanna to have to take out the weeds beforehand because some of the dandelion came out while I was transplanting some of the plants. This conifer is pretty much like now that it's established, who knows how old it is, it's probably decades old. Now that it's pretty established, I won't need to really be taking care of it except taking the leaves off of its leaves. 
Yeah, is it, a, is it a needle or a leaf? It's a, it, well, the needle is a leaf. It's just okay. a type of leaf. It's a specialized kind of leaf. And here's the Tiarella in the back that I planted and the bleeding hearts, which actually are just starting to flower, which is super cool. I loved the auburn color of the leaves and the dark red hearts. I think that's gonna contrast so well and pair so nicely with this uh, Acer palmatum. But it's surprising, like when I stuck my shovel in here, oh, the soil is so nice. <laughs> it just makes you so happy when it goes in so easily, but you know, it's not like that on all of the land. So this was an easier planting bed to plant up. But we'll return to this afterwards. We gotta go into town and uh, do some more work there, but we'll come back with the composted manure and tomorrow we'll have the uh, composted bark mulch and we'll show you how it looks after that. All right, so I wanna recap about where we landed with this planting bed right here. Um, I ended up planting up all the plants and actually adding a few more. So if you wanna see some of the natives that I planted under here, I have uh, some bloodroot. I just picked this up at the farmer's market right here. Sanguinaria canadensis. And you won't be able to see some of the uh, trillium, but I planted some trillium, which is another native bulb species in this bed, which is great. I'm also wishing I had purchased some other plants, like those bleeding hearts. I, I, I should have bought like four of them or something, but you know, it's a little bit at a time. But when I planted, I used the Espoma Biotone starter, which is great because you have all of this helpful bacteria. You also have ecto and endomycorrhizal fungi as well and it just helps with the, uh, the transplant process of getting these plants in the ground. What I did find out is when I stuck my shovel in there, uh, the soil's really nice. So it's like super amended soil because we have clay around here and there's probably like eight inches of beautiful soil. So what I'm gonna do is give it a little boost in addition to the uh, Biotone starter. I'm going to use some Espoma composted cow manure blend. And, you know, typically we would be doing compost here, but we just got stuck into the place and we're not really set up for that. So, especially if you're in a, you know, kind of small urban plot or suburban plot, you might just want to get some bagged uh, compost. So I'll be using this composted manure and I'll be spreading it on top because it'll be a nice, slow release fertilizer. I'll show you a little bit of what it looks like. So it looks like that. Right? Nice and dark. It doesn't smell like anything. You think cow dung, right? But it's composted, so it doesn't smell like cow manure. I grew up next to a cow farm. It does not smell like that, so. And then basically I'm gonna spread this over the top, you know, maybe one or two inches. And then I got some composted bark mulch. And what I'm going to do with that is after I spread the compost, I'll put the composted bark mulch on top of that, probably another two inches. And this is great, it's almost soil. You don't wanna put like wood mulch on top of this because it could actually uh, take the nitrogen out of your planting bed and then you might have chlorosis or yellowing of the leaves because it's taking that nitrogen, which is one of the most important macronutrients for your plants. Yeah, so no fresh uh, wood chips, right? No fresh wood chips. And you want to get more, you want to get more bark than you do uh, the actual wood because the, the more nutritious part is actually in the bark. So I get a hardwood composted bark mulch. And that's aged, I would say six to seven months and it'll just continue to age. But you know what will help safeguard with the nitrogen is this composted cow manure. It acts like a slow release fertilizer. So it'll give them some nutrients every time it rains or every time it artificially rains, like when I'm watering it. 
And I've actually been watering it pretty much every day because the sun, even though this is in the eastern side, I do find, and it's shaded under this pine and everything like that, I do find that it actually gets quite hot and dry. And I find that these plants um, enjoy a little extra water. So this Cornus canadensis is looking really good. I'm very happy with, uh, with this purchase. And even though it's a slow spreader, it will actually form more of a mat on the ground. But like many of our native species, it doesn't, it doesn't spread too prolifically. Now these hookahs, I'm gonna have to pick up some of their leaves. So I'm not like putting the compost and burying their leaves because they have leaves that hang down. Now there may be a more efficient way to actually apply this, but because I planted so closely together with all of these plants that I think just like doing it by hand and carefully not stepping on any of the plants because I did plant some that are bulbs. You could see this one right here is just popping up. So you have to be mindful. Here's another one. It looks like it needs a little water. That's bug bane right there. So I did go and I have to step gingerly in this bed. I created the one little space for, for me to walk over to the hose. All right, now I'm gonna add some of the composted bark mulch. Uh, I'm just putting some stones, nothing too crazy, just a little bit of stepping stones so that we know where to step when we come to the hose so that we're not stepping on any plants. These could be probably laid a little better than what they are, but it's just a little foot guide. Sort of stones that we had laying around the land. stone, watering the stones and not the plants. So part of the purpose of this uh, composted bark mulch is to actually maintain the moisture to buffer for temperature regulation, to dampen down the possibilities for weeds, and actually give a nice consistent look. I'll probably come in and finish the edges a little bit better. And it could use a little bit more composted bark mulch towards the maple, but you have to really go on your hands and knees to get back there. And I planted quite a few plants underneath this maple, which you're probably like, well, why would that be? But a lot of the plants that I planted under that maple are 
woodland varieties that like to be under shade. They wouldn't be able to tolerate a lot of light. And some of them are spring ephemerals like the trillium. So they'll often come up before the leaves even get on this acer. So, you know, they're up for four to five weeks right before the leaves get on. So we'll actually have some time, uh, some bloom it, blooms right early in the season. Next year, of course, because the trillium are just about finished blooming this year. All right, so let's try that out. <laughs> I think that works. So just turn this off. And that is really the first planting bed that we amended and planted up here. So I think that was pretty successful, but we have a lot more to plant and this is just the beginning. If you haven't heard yet, we'll be donating and investing 10% of our YouTube AdSense revenue from this channel back into the Finger Lakes community. We're so thankful that Espoma, our partners across both Plant One On Me and Flock Finger Lakes channels, will be matching those funds this year, as well as through a combination of monies and or products, depending on the project. So just know that by watching these videos, you're helping the community here.